All right, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. So today we are going to continue our story about important components in digital circuit design, and we will talk about uh, wires, introduce wires, uh, understand uh, uh, what's going on uh, with uh, wiring interconnect, how we can model them, and also how do they impact the quality metrics that we introduced, power, performance, noise, reliability, and so on. Uh, before we go, a couple uh, important announcements. Actually, the only new announcement here is that uh, it's important to memorize here 277 Quarry. That's the place where our midterm uh, related activities will occur next week. So in 277 Quarry, that's a large uh, auditorium type of room. So we will be able to all uh, uh, comfortably uh, be in that room. Uh, and... Any Okay, thanks. So review session will be on Tuesday, 6.30 till 8.30, and uh, on Thursday, uh, 6.30 till 8, uh, you'll have your midterm. Homework four is due today, and no labs, no homework next week. You have any questions about material, homeworks, midterm? Uh -huh. When will this week's labs be due? Uh, you can uh, bring them in. If you can't finish uh, this week's labs uh, in uh, during the lab session, you can just bring them in uh, next time uh, you come to the lab. So it's not next week, but the week after uh, when you do your lab number five. Okay, so last time we talked about uh, CMOS scaling, and uh, that's where uh, the material for midterm ends. So what we're going to uh, discuss today will not be covered on your midterm. So your midterm will cover chapters 1, uh, 2, 3, and 5, and now we are going to talk about wires uh, that are uh, explained in uh, chapter 4. But this is also quite uh, essential and very important to understand, because so far we analyzed basically uh, useful components. We analyzed transistors, then we uh, learned about CMOS inverter, and uh, those were all the components that were doing something useful for us. And now uh, we have to take a closer look into what happens when we try to put all these things together. We have to uh, route them and provide interconnect uh, between the components, and then uh, it's in, it turns out that as technology moves forward, wires are becoming much more and more significant, and therefore we have to spend considerable amount of time to really understand what's going on, and that's what we're going to be doing uh, today and uh, in the next class. Talk about wires. So, so far we analyzed uh, gates, logic gates, uh, that were uh, connected, in, connected in a certain fashion, and we uh, basically abstracted away the impact of uh, this interconnect. The, most, the farthest we got, we said, well, there is some capacitance sitting at the, at the node, uh, that uh, is attributed to the wire. But uh, in reality, the situation is much, much more complex. So this is just to basically give you um, a 10,000 feet preview uh, of uh, what's going on here. Is basically, uh, you can look at uh, a set of uh, transmitting gates and a set of uh, receiving gates. And then you see all these like funny shapes uh, between uh, transmitting and receiving gates that connect uh, the uh, transmitting and receiving points. And um, for simplification, uh, here is a physical view of uh, this uh, highlighted uh, region over here that basically show uh, wires in the same uh, layer of metal, which is, again, simplification. And basically, you see that uh, these wires have uh, basically jogs. They're not straight lines. And um, we assume that these wires are all on top of some uh, uh, substrate uh, material. And then we will see how we can basically understand what's going on in this sort of uh, structure and uh, develop some models. So, you know, that's what you've been doing for the transistors. That's what we did for CMOS uh, inverters. So it's basically first understand what's going on and then try to develop some uh, uh, models uh, that you can use uh, for uh, quick calculations and be able to uh, design uh, with these equations and then verify your results in SPICE. That's the same methodology that we're going to uh, carry over here. Uh, and uh, what's important now to note is that uh, although these wires may look really simple, uh, there is a lot of uh, things going on. So there is a lot of capacitances uh, between wire and the substrate. There is a lot of mutual capacitances. Uh, wires uh, have also resistance, and wires may be also inductive. 
And uh, in the past, 10 years ago, if you took this class 10 years ago, you, you may only hear about capacitance because for that uh, type of uh, frequencies that people worked uh, with at that time, you basically had just, basically, your wire is just adding some side load. It's increasing your delay a little bit, but it's nothing really significant. All I need to care about is to put some capacitive model such that I can uh, really capture the impact of wire on my power consumption. And then later on, when you increased uh, your frequencies a little bit, then actually your resistance became to matter because your wires uh, became uh, so significant that the delay due to wire was proportional to the delay of a gate. And then you really had to take into account also the resistive effects of wire because we learned that delay is proportional to the RC. And then you had to develop like more precise models for your wire. So it's RC delay model. And now when we are going to uh, multi gigahertz uh, regime of operation and also looking forward into tens of gigahertz, <coughs> then what's going on at a really ultra high frequency, then inductance becomes to matter as well. So then we will have also inductive effects. So what we are going to do in today's class is basically understand uh, uh, all of these phenomena and sort of define simple models for capacitance, uh, resistance, and inductance, and then see how we can, using these concepts, uh, can apply those models to uh, evaluate uh, their impact on quality metrics such as power, performance, reliability, and so on. So as I said, uh, the model from the previous figure can be really uh, analyzed in much more detail. And when you include uh, basically all the uh, contributors uh, that are present uh, over here, such as resistance, uh, uh, inductance, capacitance, then your model gets much more complicated ju than just a simple and single line uh, that you tend to uh, draw in your schematics. And another point also here to remember is that all these wires are actually uh, modeled now as really distributed elements. So because these are piecewise linear segments uh, that are traveling long distances at times. And then uh, for accuracy of modeling, it's really of interest to kind of break it up in little pieces and segments that you can fairly accurately model and then put them all together. And um, as I said, you have also a lot of uh, crosstalk uh, capacitance between neighboring wires. Uh, then you have capacitance to substrate. Then you have resistance uh, and serial inductance that matters at high frequencies and so on. So this becomes a really, really complicated uh, for analysis. And now we are going to try to understand these effects and to sort of uh, develop simplified models that give you sort of very good approximations for uh, design purposes. And uh, so this was 10 years ago, as I pointed out, that uh, at that time, frequencies were uh, not so significantly high that you had to include all these uh, resistive and deductive effects. So basically, people just use this lumped capacitive uh, only model. And now we will provide sort of rule, rules of thumb where each of these uh, models will hold and what are the good approximations to make. But before we go, let's go a little bit into the big picture and understand uh, the life of wires. So basically, wires live in very tall uh, skyscrapers. They, they have basically uh, structures, semiconductor structures that you have devices, really tiny devices on top. And then you have really, really tall uh, sky rise over here with a lot of layers of uh, metallization. So let me now put these things into perspective and uh, focus on a uh, figure on the left. So what's shown here is a, a cross-section uh, piece uh, of uh, cross-section of a high-end microprocessor built in 0.35 micron technology. So 350 nanometer technology. Uh, and uh, what's shown here is basically you have one, two, three, four, five layers of metal. And uh, a couple uh, things to observe, uh, basically, that all these uh, metal lines were aluminum lines. And um, what's notable is that uh, you have, in the first four layers, you have the same width of your metal lines. And then uh, in the fifth uh, metal layer, you have really this thick, fat wire uh, going on top. And uh, the reason why you want to do that is basically uh, uh, the wider and thicker the wire you make, you have lower equivalent resistance. And you can afford to do so up and uh, at the higher metal levels because uh, over there you don't have as much routing congestion because you're trying to route all your signals as much as you can in the lower metal layers. And then as you, as you escape farther up, uh, then you basically have more free space to put your uh, materials. And then you want to utilize that to do uh, 
really uh, distribute signals at a really high performance. So in uh, most cases, basically, uh, top metal levels, layers, uh, one or two top metal layers are typically reserved for distribution of clock, uh, distribution of power supply, distribution of ground, to make sure that you have all these good uh, quality signals uh, in top metal layers because they have low resistivity and they can provide really, really uh, good uh, waveforms for you. And uh, you, you notice that in between all, all of these uh, wires, you have oxide uh, dielectric. And uh, the way you connect uh, neighboring uh, metal uh, layers is to these uh, tungsten plugs. So these are basically your vias that connect uh, your metal layers. So this is a via between layer 2 and 1. This is between 3 and 2 and so on. So you can see that uh, you can uh, go pretty much like all the way from metal 5 uh, down to uh, transistor structure. A question? Why does the top layer have lower resistivity? Uh, you, we will come uh, to that uh, in a second bec because basically you will uh, see that uh, there will be some parameters that uh, uh, affect uh, resistivity of a wire. So basically there will be uh, geometry of a wire and uh, uh, type of material that you use uh, will determine the resistivity of a wire. So basically th the wider the wire and the taller the wire you have, uh, you have a uh, lower resistivity. And um, so that, that was the story basically uh, maybe 10 years ago. And then uh, let's take a look at what happens from the scaling perspective. So now we learned about technology scaling uh, of transistors and so on. So let's see uh, how wires will behave with the scaling, scaling of technology. And for that purpose, uh, here is the fast forward uh, uh, in time. And uh, we go uh, to 100 nanometer a high-end microprocessor that has now eight metal layers. So a couple important differences to observe here. So first of all, uh, now we are no longer using aluminum wires, but you are rather using copper wires. And the reason why we switched from aluminum to copper, because copper had a uh, lower uh, resistivity, and therefore it can provide a higher performance. And because as we scale technologies uh, forward, we are really interested to provide higher and higher performance. And at the time that uh, the impact of wire starts to matter for in terms of propagation delay of our gates, we really need to do something different and make wires faster such that their effect is negligible on the overall performance. So uh, change number one, we use copper material. Uh, and now you can uh, also notice that uh, instead of this oxide dielectric that was blue over here, now we have this low K dielectric that is uh, shown in green color. And what this low K means is basically when you have uh, your capacitance, uh, so you have uh, uh, that your capacitance is proportional to your epsilon uh, of your uh, oxide material divided by the thickness of that oxide. And this oxide, uh, actually perm permittivity, uh, was proportional to the absolute permittivity and this relative permittivity. And then uh, silicon dioxide, which is typically, which was typically used as the uh, oxide uh, about 10 years ago, has permittivity about 3.9, around 4. And th the best you can have is basically air. So permittivity of air is equal to 1. So this low K dielectrics means actually employing materials that have uh, good uh, properties in terms of this permittivity, and then you're trying to get to the permittivity uh, constants about 2 to 3, so you can really minimize the impact of wire capacitance, because that is really parasitic that you don't want to uh, have around. So basically, copper for resistivity purposes and also low K dielectric for uh, capacity purposes to try to sort of um, uh, get wires out of the way. And if you go back to slides now, uh, so another important observation here, you, you see that if you look at the cross section of these wires, you basically have a uh, pretty much rectangular shape where the width of the wire, if you say that this is the width, is uh, much higher than the height of the wire. And then what happened uh, with the scaling actually, basically, especially at these bottom layers, you see several things basically. You see that. Um, uh, due to uh, hi much higher integration, you basically have to put wires closer and closer together. And also, uh, we will come to that uh, in a second when we develop models uh, for resistivity and the capacitance of the wire. It basically, uh, people started uh, just uh, scaling the width of the wire, keeping the height the same, because that will give you favorable properties in terms of uh, resistance. And we will discuss that in a moment. So it's basically trading off 
uh, the impact of capacitance and resistance to make sure that we get optimal uh, performance uh, from the underlying uh, circuits. And uh, obviously, another observation uh, in technology scaling uh, is adding more um, levels of metal. So we had five metal layers, now we have seven or eight metal layers, we're going to have ten metal layers because of the complexity. Devices are becoming much more complex, you really need more layers to provide all the interconnects uh, at the chip level. Okay, so that's the big picture. And now let's go uh, and see uh, what uh, are the models uh, for each of these uh, uh, wire uh, parameters uh, that we are interested to take a look at. So basically, uh, uh, we can classify uh, parasitics uh, as capacitive, resistive, and inductive, as we saw in that uh, model uh, in the previous slides. And no matter what the class of the parasitics is, they have uh, one couple things in common. So basically, interconnect parasitics always uh, inject some noise in your circuit that affects your signal-to-noise ratio, and therefore uh, they reduce reliability noise margins, they reduce reliability of your circuit. And also, adding parasitic elements such as resistances and capacitances uh, adversely affects your uh, performance and power consumption. You have a uh, uh, longer delay, uh, worse performance, and also you have more power because you need to drive all those wires. Okay. So now let's uh, take a look at uh, what's going on with technology scaling. We are still at a very high level, top level, to understand what's going on and what do we really need to take into account when developing our models. What are really the effects that we need to understand and be able to put together in the closed form expressions that are simple enough for uh, hand analysis. So what's uh, shown here is basically a distribution of uh, the number of nets, the number of wires uh, versus the length of a wire. And this is shown for um, five generations of Intel Pentium processors. So we had Pentium Pro, Pentium 2, 3 original Pentium, and Pentium MMX. So what's really interested, interesting about uh, all of these uh, designs is a uh, couple things. So you observe basically that most of your wires are really short and that makes sense because you really want to connect primarily your transistors that are sitting next to each other, that are close to each other and you have the most of those wires because uh, of um, uh, the nature of uh, integration. And then uh, as you uh, go toward uh, higher uh, distances, basically if you go uh, sort of move away from this microscopic view when you analyze couple transistors and go up, up and up, and then you sort of look at the entire die level, then you really have to spend the whole die basically from one end of the die, you have to go uh, with some routing to all over uh, to the other end. And the number of those wires uh, is basically much uh, smaller than the number of all of these local wires. And for example, uh, the die level uh, wires, if you route your power and the clock network, those would be, for example, the global signals. They would need to travel long distances and normally you would have a mesh uh, for your clock and uh, power uh, uh, rails uh, to make sure that you have a good uh, quality uh, signal all the way across the chip. and uh, But uh, very important uh, to understand here is basically that we need to look sort of at two quantities here. When scaling our technologies, we really need to understand what's going on with the wires that scale uh, about with the same factor as our devices. If you put two, two, two devices together, uh, place them at the minimum pitch, and you need to provide the wire connection in between. So basically the length of that wire will correspond to that minimum pitch and also technology scaling uh, factor. And there you have basically this scaling factor for the local wires that is related to the technology scaling factor. On the other extreme, you basically have a problem because the die size has kept increasing and increasing with technology scaling. And now we have uh, basically instead of uh, shrinking, uh, the dies, we have long, uh, bigger and bigger dies. So we have actually smaller and smaller uh, feature size, but we have to travel bigger and bigger distances. And these global wires will really uh, create uh, a lot of problems. And that's basically two things that you really need to remember from this slide. You need to know uh, what is uh, the scaling for very short wires and what is also a scaling uh, trend for very long wires. Also, uh, in addition to that, uh, Let's take a look at what, what goes on here at the very low end uh, 
at uh, small uh, lengths of wires. So what's going on that due to technology scaling, basically you have a uh, rapid increase in the number of nets that have very short wires. And this makes sense because when you scale your technology, the distances between your uh, devices become smaller and smaller. And then you have more and more of them. So uh, this distribution sort of uh, goes uh, upward. OK. So now let's understand in each of these individual contributors uh, to uh, the wire model and first understand where it's coming from and second uh, let's see what kind of models we can use to uh, analyze uh, those uh, parameters. So let's uh, start with uh, interconnect uh, capacitance. So this is basically the story that we had so far. So we said we have really understood what's going on in all of this uh, uh, with all of these capacitances inside the transistor and so on. But now, as we saw, wire is a really complicated animal. We really need to understand what's going on. And then this uh, lumped model uh, with just modeling the wire as one capacitance is uh, no longer sufficient. It was good 10, 20 years ago, but no longer. So let's now uh, look at the nature of this wire capacitance and see uh, what we can understand from that. So for that purpose, uh, let's analyze a piece of wire over here. So let's assume that this is our wire and there is some current flowing uh, through the wire over here. And that uh, also we assume that that wire is placed at uh, some distance uh, from our substrate material or our uh, conductive uh, transistors are. And now this is just the beginning. So uh, keep in mind this will get much, much more complex uh, because you know uh, that the wires are really like uh, skyscrapers. You have a lot of freeways intersecting and going uh, at various levels. So let's now start from the bottom level and see really what's going on uh, under the hood. So basically, um, first thing to understand here is that this dielectric is not uh, really uh, the si uh, uh, this TDI. Uh, the height of this dielectric is much higher uh, than your gate oxide dielectric because that is basically just the wires that are uh, sitting uh, above your transistors. And this dielectric uh, is, uh, TDI is much higher than the T ox. And uh, if we assume that uh, there is a current flowing uh, through this wire, then basically from your EM uh, classes, you know that uh, there should be electrical fields that are terminating uh, to ground that form uh, the other end of this uh, capacitor. So if you assume that wire is sufficiently wide, much wider than uh, this TDI, if W is much higher than uh, uh, TDI, then we can assume that uh, there is just these uh, vertical field lines uh, terminating into uh, the ground, which is uh, your substrate in this case. And now you know that uh, basically that uh, the capacitance per unit area is proportional to uh, permittivity of uh, this insulating material, this dielectric over here, and inversely proportional to the height of that material. That's what you know. And then you also know that uh, your total wire capacitance that's formed uh, with this uh, metal and the substrate is proportional to that area, unit area capacitance, and the geometry of that wire, area of the wire, W and L. And uh, so important uh, to know here is that uh, the capacitance of your wire is proportional to the overlap with the underlying material and is inversely proportional to the distance. That means if you uh, analyze higher metal uh, levels, they will have uh, smaller capacitance uh, to ground and uh, the capacitance of the wire will be proportional to uh, the area of the wire. Now, what's interesting here is to see, now that we know about scaling, let's see what's going to happen with wires if you do technology scaling. So let's go uh, quickly to uh, the overhead camera, thanks. And so we have that our capacitance of the wire is equal to this uh, area capacitance times uh, W times L. And this was basically, uh, epsilon uh, dielectric oxide divided by T ox times W times L. Now, if we assume that uh, oxide capacitance, uh, oxide uh, thickness and the width of the wire are technology parameters, so that's basically what you scale with your technology. No surprises there. You have the scaling factor S. So, uh, therefore, the C wire will be proportional from this 1 over T ox. T ox scales as 1 over S. So you have uh, S over here. W scales with 
1 over s. So it basically shrinks, assuming that s is greater than 1. And now remember the story that we just said. Basically, you have to take into account two types of wires. One is local wires, and the other is global wires. And the only difference is this length. So we now can no longer assume that L is scaling with the S factor. So let's assume that L scales with some uh, different factors. So it's sc scaling of the length of the wire. So now these two cancel out, and we have that C wire is proportional to proportional to one over the scaling factor of the length for the length of the wire. Now uh, what we can conclude from here. So if you have local wire. Uh, then uh, capacitance of that wire decreases because uh, scaling factor for that wire is uh, greater than 1. So that means that that wire shrinks. Uh, in ideal case, uh, when you analyze really like uh, uh, the case where uh, your local wire scale with the same factor as technology, you have 1 over S. And then you have global wire. wire capacitance increases because the scaling factor is less than 1, because the size of your die gets bigger and bigger. So that's really important to uh, take away from uh, this brief analysis over here. OK. So now let's switch back to slides, please. Thank you. So now what can we do to? Uh, adjust uh, this parasitic capacitance. So we can, uh, as I mentioned, choose a different material uh, for uh, the oxide uh, that has favorable permittivity properties. So commonly used was uh, silicon dioxide. And uh, uh, lately, uh, this organic material, polyimides, are becoming really popular that can reduce uh, our uh, permittivity to about 3 or 4. And uh, we really need to get to the ultimate goal of uh, the free space, uh, 1. And uh, so now uh, this is really becoming problematic because as you see that uh, the speed of your uh, transistors and the feature sizes are scaling exponentially. And now uh, for the wire capacitance, you can't really do that anymore because you're pretty much stuck with these material properties. And then you have to think of something else. And uh, there's also quite a bit of uh, research going on in these uh, aerogels. So these are kind of uh, oxide materials that have air bubbles in, and they can reduce permittivity pretty close to uh, the permittivity of uh, free space. And they will eventually uh, be employed in the future. But you, know, you see that as you go, for example, to the PC board, when you put uh, your chip into test environment and you uh, uh, have your printed circuit board, then uh, the permittivity increases. So you have more capacitance, even more parasitics uh, that are uh, present over there. And uh, so let's now go Question? over to, yes. Uh, can you increase the distance between your uh, metal layers to increase uh, to decrease the capacitance? Can you increase the distance between metal layers to decrease the capacitance? Uh, certainly you can, uh, but then that's going to cost you in area, right? That's a good idea. So now let's see what's going on uh, with uh, this our, sim our simple model. So we assume that uh, the cross-section of a wire is such that the width of the wire is greater than the height of the wire. Now, with technology scaling, uh, we said, and uh, that will become obvious uh, in a moment, that we kept this height constant and we kept shrinking the width. So now, uh, today, we have pretty much a scenario like this. So we have that the height of the wire is greater than the width of the wire. Now, what's that going to uh, mean for our uh, model that we just developed? So basically, let's now put our wire that has this form factor on top of uh, substrate material. So now we can no longer basically approximate the electric field just going straight down, because we have all of these components from the side of the wire that is called fringing field. And then you have really complicated distribution of electrical field lines. And this now assumes that you have some, this is your length of a wire. L. And this is the height height of the wire. 
So now we have to really refine our model and say a uh, parallel plate model that we uh, developed in this case, assuming that uh, all these electric field lines terminate uh, directly vertically down to uh, the substrate is no longer valid. So now we have a two a combination of two parallel capacitances. We have parallel plate capacitance and we have this fringing component. And this fringing component fringing component is equal to uh, this uh, capacitance per unit area multiplied uh, by the height of the wire because this is really technology constant. So we want to uh, embed that uh, building thing into this parameter and that is also uh, then a function of uh, this L. So that's uh, just this fringing component. Ba basically, the analysis of this fringing component is really, really complicated. We can only make uh, good approximations. And uh, you will see in the, uh, in the slides, I will show you basically how does this uh, CH uh, look like. So now you have that your wire capacitance is equal to this parallel plate capacitance, which is just uh, epsilon over T uh, dielectric times WL plus two times uh, this fringing capacitance uh, per unit length times uh, the length of the wire, because you have both sides, so it's two times. And this is uh, uh, pretty much like a technology parameter over here that depends on the type of dielectric that you use and depends on also on the height of uh, your wire. So now model is getting much more uh, complicated. Okay, so now let's go back to slides. So then we basically have uh, uh, this model of a wire that can be decomposed into two components. We have uh, basically this fringing component of a round wire above the substrate and we have this parallel plate model. Now notice that this uh, W here is equal to W minus H over 2 where H is really the height of our wire. And then you see that this fringing capacitance is uh, given by this logarithmic uh, dependence. This is also approximation but you can uh, basically treat uh, this as a some technology uh, provided parameter that you have fringing capacitance per unit length. That's all you care about. And then you have also this parallel plate capacitance per unit area. And then you're ready to go uh, to develop uh, your models. So now let's see what happens really now that you understand there is two components of uh, wire capacitance. Uh, how big they are? What's the relationship between the two? Where should I, how, when should I matter about fringing? When should I matter about parallel plate, uh, and so on? So that's uh, answered in this graph here. So what what's this showing is basically the capacitance uh, per unit length of a wire for different scenarios. And uh, please don't confuse this H with the height of the wire. So basically, this is H is now uh, in this graph. Uh, particularly uh, height of this dielectric and T is the height of the wire. But uh, what you really want to understand is, uh, let's assume that we have this parallel plate model. So basically the wider the wire you have uh, more capacitance because uh, you just multiply that W for the capacitance per unit length. So you would expect uh, this linear trend. And now uh, for very large W over uh, H you have uh, basically the case where you have uh, the total capacitance that pretty much follows the trend of your parallel plate model. So when you have a very wide wire, you can approximate that model with this parallel plate. Now, uh, if you uh, change uh, the ratio of this height of the wire and the distance uh, to the dielectric, and let's say we just uh, pick one value and keep it constant, that the height of the wire is equal to the distance from dielectric, then we see uh, that uh, we have uh, basically as we uh, decrease the width of the wire that we have more and more pronounced uh, fringing capacitance and at uh, when the height of the wire uh, width of the wire is equal to uh, this uh, H parameter then you have basically approximation that uh, both per uh, fringing and parallel plate are about equal at W over H is equal to 1 and then if you keep uh, reducing your W 
your capacitance is dominated by the fringing capacitance. And then the fringing capacitance can be really like up to 10 times larger than your parallel plate capacitance. So a good rule of thumb here, uh, just quickly going to the overhead, if, is, is if you have really wide wire, so if your H is here and W is here, if W much higher than H, so you have C wire is parallel plate, then if you have a square type of scenario, W about equal to H, then you have C parallel plate about equal to fringe. And over here, which is the case in uh, designs today, when H is greater than W, you have uh, C fringe is much greater than parallel plate. You have the dominant fringing capacitance, and this is technology today. Okay, so now let's go back to slides. So now that was just analysis of a single wire. Now you have multiple wires running uh, next to each other and at multiple layers. So you really need to consider basically uh, mutual capacitances between uh, wires. You have, uh, for example, in this illustration, you have two layers of uh, interconnect. And what happens now is that your capacitances, number one, no longer terminate to ground, but rather they terminate to other wires. And um, Basically, the uh, parallel plate capacitance from uh, the top level uh, wires is getting reduced uh, relative to ground because of the height of the wire with respect to your uh, substrate. And then you really have all of these capacitances terminating between all of these uh, wires. So what this is going to uh, tell you basically is that you are now uh, more interested about interwire capacitance rather than the capacitance to ground. Now the question is why interwire capacitances are really, really bad. What happens if you have uh, one capacitance, uh, two wires with some mutual capacitance and then a signal on one wire really swings around? So it's going to affect your other wire. You have crosstalk, right? And for that purpose, uh, it's uh, not very uncommon that people uh, use extra uh, layers and extra wires just for shielding purposes. Basically, you have your two signals that are interfering with each other, and you would like to put in between a uh, really thick wire with, for example, ground or VDD, so that you minimize uh, the interconnect between uh, the two neighboring wires. But now, basically, your interwire capacitance is getting larger because all your parasitic capacitances are terminating to other wires and your capacitance to ground is uh, getting smaller. So that those are important takeaway points. And this structure is becoming much, much more complicated as you go toward uh, higher uh, metal layers. And also, the capacitance originating from one wire is now bigger than the single isolated wire case. Because if you assume now that uh, we have our wire, and then we had just the field lines down to our oxide. Now let's assume that you have sort of a, like a cage, a shield from other wires, and then you have much more electric field lines, and therefore your capacitance overall is higher. And that really creates uh, you a problem uh, with crosstalk. Okay, so much for uh, wires for the first hand analysis. Now let's um, and this is actually shown here, what I just said. Basically, that with the scaling of technology, is if, if you keep shrinking your uh, feature size, then you have this par impact of parallel plate wire uh, diminishing. And also, uh, capacitance to ground is also getting smaller. And this interwire capacitance, capacitance that terminates to other wires because you have more uh, routing, more interconnect, and more interconnect layers, that is really becoming the dominant. Uh, capacitance and uh, if you don't do anything uh, with technology materials and, and so on, uh, this capacitance will keep increasing. And this is finally about uh, the wiring capacitance. The table 
uh, that you also have in the book and you don't particularly need to memorize any numbers from uh, this table but I guess two important takeaway points uh, from this table uh, that you should uh, keep with you are the following. So you basically have uh, contributions from both uh, parallel plate and fringing uh, components. So fringing uh, component is grayed and uh, parallel plate component is uh, white. And you basically know that, for example, for aluminum 4, you have two times higher fringing than uh, the parallel plate capacitance. So that's takeaway point number one. Fringing dominates because of the shape of wire that we have today. And also, uh, you can uh, observe that uh, the capacitance between, for example, aluminum wire 4 and aluminum uh, 3 between two neighboring uh, wire layers is fairly high and then as you increase distance between wires and go toward uh, more distant uh, layers then your capacitance decreases which you see from here 45 versus 18 for example between wires 4 and uh, 1. All right let's now go into interconnect uh, resistance so we look at the same wire and over here, same keep the same uh, geometry, uh, W, L, and H. And uh, then we see uh, that the resistance of a wire, obviously when you have a longer wire, you have to have a uh, larger resistance. So your resistance is uh, directly proportional to the length of the wire. And there is this um, uh, parameter, uh, technology parameter, rho divided by H, and this really depends on the material type that you use, but you basically, when you scale uh, this parameter by uh, this H, you get uh, your uh, resistance, uh, uh, sh sheet resistance of your wire. So it's basically, uh, that is the square, uh, equivalent resistance of a square. So basically, your, uh, if your wire is of this size, then it will have a resistance R1. And if you keep increasing that square, you still have the same resistance, basically. So your resistance of the wire is proportional to this sheet resistance. Uh, the, longer, the longer the wire, uh, more resistance you have, right? And uh, when you keep decreasing W, you also have more resistance. So let's now see how does this model scale with technology. So we have this is the height of the wire, then going in this direction is L, and this is W. Then we have that R is equal this rho divided by H times L over W. And let's see now how does this scale uh, with technology. So we say that uh, that both. Let's assume first that we scale all the dimensions in the same way. So we scale, apply the scaling factor S, and we get basically new technology with all parameters shrinked in size by this factor S. So now we have because this is a material constant, we assume that we use the same material. So now we have uh, basically uh, H and W scheme s scale in the same way. So we have S squared. And then the length of the wire, again, we have to con uh, distinguish between local and global wires. So we have uh, SL. So now for the case of local wires, when SL is equal to S, uh, then we have that resistance is proportional to this factor S. And it uh, goes up. And for the global wires, we have to assume that we have some other scaling uh, factor that basically our uh, global wire, so we have S squared over SD, so that's the die level uh, type of scaling. So now we have that SD is uh, any factor between 1 and S. So because the die size has been increasing, so we have that SD, let's say if, if we make an approximation that SD is approximately 1 over S, then we have that the global wire resistance is proportional to the cube factor. And it is really, really huge. Huge increase in uh, wire 
resistance. In reality, this is really between S squared and uh, S cubed. And this is really uh, a reason why we don't want to scale the height of the wire in the same way. So now let's refine the model, assuming that we have this type of scenario. So let's keep the height of the wire constant. And just scale W and L. So now we have that our wire is resistance is proportional to this rho over H times L over W. And now this is called the sheet resistance. It's basically a resistance per square. So now the question is how many squares do you have along this axis uh, that will define your resistance? So this is now a constant. And uh, now when we uh, look at the scaling uh, for short wires, we have uh, W scales with S, L scales with SL, and therefore when, when S is equal to SL, then we have approximately constant resistance. And this is uh, in agreement with uh, the scaling model that we did in the last class, when we basically derived it from the different uh, approach, where we said that uh, resistance is voltage divided by average current, and then figured out it was a constant, and the only uh, improvement in delay came from capacitance reduction. And then we had long wires. Then we have basically S times some factor uh, S um, that is between, um, so let's see, some, some factor that is between uh, 1 and S. So it's basically you have between S and S squared. So this is better. Uh, definitely, but it's uh, still bad. And then you, then you have to actually look for better materials to uh, reduce your wire resistance. That's the reason, uh, for example, why you went from the aluminum over to copper. And let's go back to slides now. So that is basically explaining now uh, what you can do. Uh, why would you switch from, for example, aluminum material to copper material because that gives you better uh, conductivity. And this is the table shown here. Uh, that's interesting that, uh, for example, conductivity of a copper is better than, for example, a gold. And the silver is uh, still the best conductor, but it's very expensive for commercial use. So now uh, today's processes predominantly use copper, which is still pretty close to the best you can uh, achieve. And aluminum, as you see, that was used in the past is uh, 2.7. It's almost uh, 1.5 times larger than uh, uh, the copper unit resistance. Okay. So now, how to deal with resistance? What you can do? It's basically one idea is to do this selective technology scaling, basically keeping the height of the wire the same and just shrinking the width of the wire. Uh, better interconnect materials are always good. Uh, and also reducing the average wire length is also good. So sort of uh, have all your uh, wiring done locally and then uh, be gentle on using these uh, global wires. And uh, another uh, also uh, guideline here, which you may find surprising a little bit, is to have more interconnect layers. Now the question is, why would more interconnect layers help you? Any ideas? So more interconnect layers, less resistance. What happens if you have uh, really few layers of uh, interconnect? So then, then what goes on is that you have to provide all of this routing, really dense uh, routing. And then uh, since you have uh, lot of other objects around, you have to oftentimes jog around, you have to provide uh, contacts, escape uh, to other metal layers and then go back and so on. So you have a lot of overhead in these uh, extra segments that you need to uh, escape uh, other objects around and also you have extra contact resistance uh, from jumping uh, up and down. So if you have just uh, more letter metal layers, you just uh, bring uh, the wire up to the top metal layer, route all the way through and then bring it back down. So that will uh, also reduce your uh, resistance. OK. 
So another way to deal with resistance is actually uh, to use these uh, higher conductivity materials. For example, for uh, the gate, uh, we adopted the strategy that uh, gate is silicided uh, with a material that has much better conductivity, about uh, eight to ten times uh, higher than poly. And we also discussed this earlier uh, in the class, is that uh, the reason why you don't want to use completely silicided gate is because it doesn't bond well uh, with this uh, oxide. And so we basically use uh, this as a sandwich. So you have a polysilicon for uh, bonding purposes, and then you have a silicided uh, material on top. And this is called polyside gate. So you have polysilicon and uh, silicide. And now most of the current is going through uh, this silicide material because uh, current always goes through the path of uh, less uh, resistance. And um, this improves uh, the conductivity of uh, your gate material. Uh, here's the sheet resistance of some uh, uh, of the materials. Uh, so basically you have a uh, huge improvement from uh, silicide, as you see here, that uh, just, uh, let's see, polysilicon. If you look at polysilicon, uh, then you have uh, the silicide that improves quite dramatically uh, the conductivity. But now, uh, here's a question for you. Uh, let's see, for example, from this table, you would think that uh, a diffusion can be good, can be a good wire. It's, for example, better than uh, uh, polysilicon. So why don't we use diffusion? You can perfectly create a nice wire in diffusion. You can just basically have N plus and wire. So the question is, why don't you use, because it has uh, smaller resistance. What's the reason? idea additional capacitance exactly so that's that's exactly right so basically uh, you need to care about two components now you can't uh, just look at one single component and say oh this one is a little bit better so I'm going to use it so uh, this one has a substantial uh, diffusion capacitance between uh, this uh, uh, n plus p uh, materials and then you basically that your area capacitance uh, from uh, this diffusion is much, much higher than uh, the capacitance of the polysilicon. So for uh, performance purposes, you don't uh, want to use diffusion. Okay, so this is what you've uh, already seen, but uh, it's interesting uh, to see like uh, that uh, all of these um, jogs that you have trying to escape other wires and other objects. So that's what you want to avoid. So it's basically a pretty complicated 3D structure that you have in reality with your wires. So here's an example of a quarter micron process, uh, uh, Intel uh, process, that has one, two, three, four, five metal layers. Uh, so what you see from here is uh, a couple things. So as we discussed, uh, we have that the height of the wire is smaller than the width of the wire. And that is especially the case in these lower uh, levels of interconnect. And then also you see that uh, the wires are getting bigger and wider, taller and wider at the higher layers because that improves uh, your performance. And those are the wires that are used for high performance uh, signaling for clock and for power and ground distribution. And you also see that uh, normally uh, the way the wires are routed on a chip, you basically start metal one is normally you, you do it in the horizontal direction, uh, very occasionally in the, in the uh, vertical. And then you have uh, the next metal layer going uh, vertical and then horizontal, vertical, and so on, all the way uh, up to the top level metal. And it's also a uh, very common practice to use the shielding wires because you just want to make sure that you eliminate impact of interconnect uh, between uh, the wires and uh, impact of crosstalk, signal contamination uh, purposes. And um, so those are some of the good uh, design uh, practices uh, that you uh, should remember. And these are, again, all these via plugs that go from in this case, for example, metal 3, metal 2, metal 1, and all the way down to the substrate. So now, 
that we understand what are the con contributors, uh, two of the major contributors that we uh, analyzed in uh, CMOS transistors for propagation delay. Let's see now how we can really refine uh, the impact of wire on our performance analysis. And let's see what are uh, types of models that we can uh, develop for a wire. Uh, this is actually a uh, a story that would be good, as I said, 10, 20 years ago, when you just model the wire as one lumped uh, element for very low frequencies. You just basically have, let me simplify my uh, wire with just one uh, element, and then I'm uh, lumping it to the output of my gate. So I have equivalent drive resistance, I have lumped capacitance, and I can simply calculate my propagation delay 0.69 RC, and I'm done. But the problem is that uh, this is uh, too simple and this model is very inaccurate. And then you will see that uh, reality is actually better than this in terms of performance. And uh, that's what we are going to uh, do next. So basically now uh, let's assume that we have some really long wire. And what happens is actually that we can't uh, assume that so if we have transmitting and receiving and uh, then you can't really assume uh, with this lumped model that the signal uh, appears at the same time at both transmitting and receiving end. Due to the wire properties you will have some finite propagation delay and actually your wire will really sort of uh, this, uh, provide some extra delay for this signal uh, going from the transmitter to the receiver and sort of uh, this signal will diffuse over uh, from uh, source to uh, destination. So we have to really refine our model and sort of analyze uh, a wire with more accuracy. So we have basically a very long wire so let's divide it up in pieces and now resistance becomes to matter. So we can now basically provide a segment-based uh, model. And if you really uh, have extra time uh, at home uh, this week, you can try to solve this uh, accurately. Just provide analysis for like a two-segment uh, approximation for a wire. You'll see it's really, really complicated. And uh, But then in reality, you have much more than that. And then the analysis really gets out of hand. You can use your favorite simulator uh, spice to sort of uh, simulate, but even that uh, will, in some cases, take a very long time. So now we will, uh, obviously, as we did uh, so far, adopt some really simple models that are accurate enough uh, to be able to model the impact of uh, wires. And that's shown on uh, this next uh, slide over here. So basically, instead of just lumping it all together into one single model and say I have total resistance from a wire and I have total capacitance of a wire and then I'm going to do this RC, you're really going to use this segmented approach where you have wires of various lengths that can be modeled uh, with the same uniformed approach. When you say I really know what is my resistance per unit length and my capacitance per unit length. And now depending on the length of the wire, I will have different number of segments that model my wire. And this is actually expressed in symbolically as uh, this this uh, distributed RC line is this uh, resistance and then underlined with this capacitance. So what's really going on uh, over here is uh, you probably uh, seen this sort of expression before that instead of uh, just instantaneously showing up at both uh, source and uh, destination and you really have that your signal is sort of diffusing through and uh, similarly to the way that the carriers get diffused between N and NP uh, type of materials. But what's going on here is uh, that um, uh, first of all let's try to uh, okay provide a simple model. Let's go back to overhead for a second. Uh, to understand where is this coming from. So you basically have resistance per unit length, this is your uh, small r, times this delta L, for that's uh, the segment uh, for a wire, and then you have this capacitance per unit length, delta L, and then you have resistance uh, delta L. So let's assume that we analyze this node I over here, and then we have I minus 1 over here, and then we have 
i plus 1 over here. But we are really interested to see what's going on over at this node. So by, by just summing the currents and using this finite element uh, analysis type of thing, you have C times delta L uh, voltage dV on dt. So that's the current that's going through this capacitor, IC, right? So that's equal to the sum of these two currents that are coming from uh, these two resistive branches. And then you have VI plus 1 minus VI divided by R times delta L. So that's this current coming from this side. And then from this side, you have VI minus 1 minus VI also divided by the same resistance. Now, when you assume that your L is infinitely small, then this becomes basically RC times dV over dt is equal to dV d squared v dx squared. And this is your diffusion equation. So what this tells you now is that the voltage at given position x away from the source, if this is your 0 and this is your x, on this axis is a function of time and also distance uh, from uh, the source. Okay. So now let's go back to slides. Thank you. And so the behavior of the wire is expressed with this uh, diffusion uh, equation. So now if you plug this in into SPICE and do a simulation, you will quickly find that uh, the propagation delay due to this wire and the time constant given uh, for this wire is no longer 0.69 RC if you assume that the total R is equal uh, to this uh, little r per unit length times the length of the wire and your total C is equal to uh, C per unit length times uh, L of the wire. So you, you will uh, be surprised that you get answer about half of what you expect. So uh, precisely it's equal to 0.38 R total R times uh, total C uh, and that is about one half of uh, 0.69 and we will um, derive that result uh, in a moment but uh, this is a graph that really explains you what goes on with this uh, distributed wire model so this plots voltage uh, over time at a different length from source of uh, your signal coming into the wire so for x is equal l over two, uh, l over 10, where l is the length of the wire, you have uh, this nice waveform. And then if you keep increasing the distance farther away from source, then uh, your waveform gradually builds at that point. So it's sort of really like your voltage diffuses over time and as it travels from uh, the source to destination. So you really have to sort of understand that uh, distributed uh, model, modeling approach. And now, uh, as I said, we will make uh, an approximation for uh, dealing with this distributed model. And uh, uh, this is what you're going to really like. And Elmore delay uh, type of calculation is going to be your friend. Uh, so this was basically a model developed in the uh, 1940s uh, that uh, uh, Elmore uh, found. Uh, and that was pretty uh, good observation that allows us to model uh, the wires and this is actually what what this says so let's assume that we have some sort of rc network say this is r1 this is c1 and this is what we know how to analyze it's basically just 0.69 rc let's add more complexity to this so you have c2 r3 c3 R4, C4. So what Elmer delay approach uh, tells you is that 
the time constant can be approximated in the following way. So you basically take a look first uh, going from uh, the source uh, over to destination. You go, go uh, this way and then at each node you see what is the total capacitance of that node. So you have C1 and then multiply uh, with equivalent resistance uh, from the source to that node, all the way up to that node. So you have C1, R1. That is from this capacitance. Then you go to the next node, then you have C2. And then the total resistance between these two points, between the source and that node, is R1 plus R2. So multiply by R1 plus R2. And then you go over to this node. So you have C3 and do the same. So now you have R1 plus R2 plus R3. And then you have finally C4 times R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4. So this can be expressed in a nice uh, form for N segment uh, type of network, assuming that uh, you have N segments. So you have I is equal to 1 over N, uh, 1 to N. So you have your CI, and then that gets multiplied by the uh, resistance that's between uh, the source and node I. So you have RJ. This can be also equivalently expressed the other way around. You can basically look at uh, the node uh, resistance uh, at that point and see what is what are all the capacitances that that resistance is impacting. For example, if you look at the R1, then you uh, impacting capacitance C1, 2, 3, and 4, all the capacitances down the chain. So you basically have equivalently, you can say this is equal uh, 1 to N. I have all my resistances I. And now I have to go with my uh, J from I to N. So that's going all over to the destination and CJ. Right. So it's a very simple model and gives fairly accurate results. So now let's apply this model to our distributed uh, model that we showed in the previous slide when we assume that we have uh, a large number of segments. So in this model then we have segment 1, segment 2, and so on, and then we have segment n. So this is segment 1, segment 2, segment n, and each of these has resistance R delta L, C delta L, R delta L, C delta L. So now if you uh, look at equivalent time constant, so then we basically have uh, for this node over here, so we have C delta L times the equivalent resistance R delta L. And then we have plus, at this node we also have C delta L times, now we have 2 times R delta L plus and so on. We have C delta L times N times R delta L. So now this is equal to uh, C times R times delta L squared times 1 plus 2 plus and so on plus N. So now if you assume that the total length of our wire is equal to N, L, sorry, then you have that your delta L is equal to L over N if you have N segments, right? So now this is now equal to C times R times L over N, L squared over N squared, and then times, uh, this, this is what you know how to do, so it's basically N times uh, N plus 1 divided by 2. Now this is, uh, C times L is your total lumped capacitance, capacitance per unit area times the total length of a wire. And R is your total lumped resistance. So you can write this as 
RC times and then this squared and this goes away so you have n plus 1 divided by 2n and now obviously for very large n you have RC over 2 so basically you get that the delay of your wire is really shorter than what you would expect from the lumped model and this is really important to understand uh, you can um, basically use that simple approach uh, with lumped models and say okay I'm going to calculate I know this is wrong but I'm going to calculate it uh, just to get uh, the number that I'm going to scale by 2 and I have accurate results so from the distributed model you actually have that your time constant time distributed you have 0.38 RC and then you have that's the delay from the distributed and then uh, delay from the lumped model is 0.69 RC Okay, so now let's do uh, another example over here. Let's assume that, um, so let's go back to slides for a second. So this is basically what we uh, just derived, that we uh, have RC over 2 approximately from the distributed model, and that's very important to, to understand. Um, let's get back to this later, but let's go uh, forward and... Uh, Let's analyze a little bit more complex situation here because you normally have branching in your uh, circuits and so on. So let's analyze a scenario where we have a sort of um, complicated network and then we have to provide a delay calculation for a certain node. So let's assume that we are dealing with something like this. So C2, R2. R1, C1, R3, C3, R4, C4, R5. So now let's assume that you want to calculate propagation delay between the source node over here and the destination over here. So we have to go through this path. And now again we are going to use help from Elmore and then figure out uh, the way we uh, calculate uh, time constant. So the way you calculate time constant in this case you also sort of uh, go around, uh, you sum up over all your nodes in the circuit, equivalent capacitance, and uh, you multiply that by uh, mutual resistance uh, that is uh, between uh, source and that capacitance and source and the destination end. So let me explain that on this example. So you have tau over here is equal C1 times uh, resistance between that node, node number one, and the source is only R1. Now you have also a contribution from this off-path capacitance is over here. So now you have C2 times and now the resistance that is mutual to your original path over here blue and the resistance total resistance that you would have otherwise from the source and node that you are currently analyzing has to be taken into account so only resistance that lies on both paths here is R1 so you put R1 now you have C3 so that is basically mutual resistance between this node and S and also this blue line over here. So you have R1 plus R3. Now you have C4. 
for the C4, you also have R1 plus R3, right? That's the mutual. And finally, for the C5, you have R1, R3, and R5. Okay. C2? Okay, let's do another example. That's a very good point, actually. I'm glad you asked the question. So let's do a slightly less complicated example to sort of illustrate the point. So let's say this is C1, this is R1, and let's assume that we have R2, C2, R3. So let's assume that uh, now we have source over here and destination over here and we just need to com compute this time constant for this path. So now you would have C1 times R1 plus C2 times R1. That's the, the only mutual uh, resistance plus C3 times uh, R1. So now this hopefully uh, uh, clarifies the setup for your question. So when you basically have just uh, RC network over here, but then the question is why do you want to include this? Uh, and that's a perfectly valid question. The reason why you want to do that is simply because uh, your current is no longer only provided through this RC network, but your current is also going to, to charge all of these other capacitances. And therefore, you have less current than you would have had if uh, nothing was attached to this node. And for that reason, uh, it makes sense to include all of these, because that is actually uh, the amount of charge that you need to uh, deliver in charging these capacitances is actually stolen away from uh, this capacitance C1 it would have been otherwise charged on C1 if nothing was connected. And now you have to account for that because now you have less current uh, going through your C1 than what would you normally have if nothing was uh, over here. And therefore you have longer propagation delay because of reduced uh, drive current. Does that answer your question? Okay, any other questions? Okay, so now let's go back to slides for a moment. Thank you. Uh, so this also gives you actually uh, a little bit more general expression for delay calculation. If you have uh, basically two nodes over here, then you would uh, look at the mutual resistance between uh, these two nodes and, and the source. If you have, for example, to cal calculate propagation delay between various uh, points, uh, uh, to various points, and uh, that's uh, we can uh, discuss that in more detail uh, next time. Uh, so now let's see what we uh, have over here. So now basically, uh, le let me finish finish with this, uh, wrap it up in a, in a minute, and then we'll continue next time. So now uh, that we understand this distributed uh, RC model, let's now see how can we uh, calculate basically the propagation delay from uh, our gate that is modeled with this uh, step voltage and some equivalent source resistance and then we have all this business uh, from the wire so basically we have uh, resistance over wire capacitance over wire per unit length and certain uh, length for a wire and then we have output voltage so now uh, the time constant is basically equal to using the Elmer delay uh, model approach. So you have this uh, source resistance uh, going from the source all the way to the output it sees uh, wire capacitance, CW. And now we have uh, the wire resistance. Uh, starting from the wire resistance, you basically see only uh, CW, but you have to divide that by two because of that distributed uh, model approach that we adopted. So this basically now refines our calculation for delay that we had uh, purely from the lumped model. So you had 0.69 RS CW 
and that is just for driving the capacitance, which was a good model long time ago. And now if you want to include the resistive effect of a wire in this distributed model, then you have this additional factor, 0.38 RW times CW. So your, your delay is the delay of uh, a wire as a load driven by this source resistance plus delay of the wire itself. And that's what you need to uh, account for. And let's continue this uh, next time uh, uh, on Tuesday. Thank you.